Good morning. We're going to get started this morning with an invocation uh, from Bill Search, Executive Pastor of Education at Crossings Community Church, and that will be followed by the Pledge of Allegiance led by Mary Kate Darr, representing Girl Scouts Troop 3469. Please stand. Before I pray, I'd like to thank you for the work that you do. I'm a pastor that's a Latin term for shepherd, and I shepherd a flock at a church, but you shepherd the flock of this city. And so from one shepherd to other shepherds, thank you for your service. Let's pray together. Eternal Father, we are grateful for the opportunity that we have to live in this great city. Lord, we know the challenges that lay before us, and this fine group of people before us know even more of those challenges. So we pray that you give wisdom and discernment to those who make such decisions that affect the lives of others. Let those decisions be pleasing to you. Let them be consistent with the conscience that you have played within each one of us. Lord, we are aware of the challenges of our community and our culture, the greater challenges of violence and desolation and different pockets, both in this city as well as abroad. And Lord, we pray for your justice, your righteousness, and your peace. Lord, for the part that we all play in impacting the lives of others, let us do so to the honor of you with respect to the dignity of others. We pray this. Amen. Please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Pastor, and thank you, Mary Kate. All right, I call this meeting of the City Council to order, and uh, we do have one presentation from Office of the Mayor, and I'll make my way to the front for that. All right, Anita and everybody, whoever's coming up, feel free to step forward. We had such a wonderful musical performance this morning. Join me here. And uh, the reason for that is that it is Charlie Christian International Music Festival Week, and we would like to learn a little bit more about that. And so I would ask the clerk to read this proclamation. Whereas the Black Liberated Arts Center, now in the 53rd year, was organized to showcase the cultures of African Americans and has brought to our city and our state the best in fine arts and arts education experiences, to help develop the artistic talents and teaching abilities of Oklahomans. And whereas the Black Liberated Arts Center has produced the annual Carly Christian International Music Festival in Oklahoma City for the education and enrichment of all people for 36 years. And whereas the Black Liberated Arts Center recognizes the contributions of many Oklahoma musicians to the field of music through the Charlie Christian International Music Festival to be held June 3rd, 4th, and 5th, 2022. And whereas the Black Liberated Arts Center will celebrate Charlie Christian's musical contributions to the world with a jazz brunch and a musical salute to legendary music groups, including the original After Five Jazz Band, straight out of Oklahoma City, Taylor Christman, local Oklahoma singer, now famous in Boston, and many other Oklahoma music legends at the Charlie Christian International Music Festival. And whereas the Black Liberated Arts Center has brought immeasurable recognition to Oklahoma City through the Charlie Christian International Music Festival and has established the festival as an international attraction for Oklahoma City, as the sponsoring organization of the event and posthumous recipient of the Nesserai Ertigan Jazz Hall of Fame Award given at Lincoln Center in New York City and the Oklahoma Hall of Fame Award. 
Now therefore, I, David Holt, Mayor of the City of Oklahoma City, do hereby proclaim June 3 through 5, 2022 to be Charlie Christian International Music Festival Week in Oklahoma City and encourage all citizens to take this opportunity to experience the musical artistry in, of the festival and commend the Black Liberated Arts Center for their service to this community. Thank you. Well, yes, so Charlie Christian, of course, Rock and Roll Hall of Famer and, and many other Hall of Fame uh, inductions as well has, has for a century now been somebody that we've been very proud to call our native son. And I'm so grateful to Anita and everybody at Black Liberated Arts Center for continuing that legacy all these years. Um, really cool t-shirts, by the way. I bet those are available for sale. And, <laughs> and we'd love to hear a few words from you, uh, Adita. Thank you. It's our pleasure once again to present the Charlie Christian International Music Festival. Um, just a brief history lesson for those of you who may not be familiar with Charlie Christian because he is a well-kept secret sort of known internationally. Um, Charlie Christian grew up in Oklahoma City. He attended Douglas High School and our t-shirts say that. And on the back of the t-shirt, I'll let you see the four Douglas High Schools that we have photos of. Uh, it's a historic shirt. And uh, Charlie Christian's image can be seen down on um, Lee Street, Walker Street, down the, right down Reno. Uh, he's on the side of a building. Uh, Charlie Christian was the father of the single string solo on the electric guitar. And he learned that while a student at Douglas High School by experimenting, he said he was self-taught. They had not even invented the electric guitar when he put the microphone down in the hole and started plucking. And when the electric guitar came out, he was the first and only one in the, in the whole world really that knew how to play the instrument because he could put the technology with the music. And it was two years later after he was dead that the next guitarist, Django Reinhardt, discovered how Charlie Christian played that electric guitar. And any guitar player should know their guitar history. And if they don't, you tell them to call me <laughs> at Black Liberated Arts Center. 524-3800, we're located at 4500 North Lincoln Boulevard, and we love having you and the musicians, all the many musicians who have played in our festival. Thank you for having us this morning and allowing us the opportunity to inform you. Absolutely, and you mentioned the image of Charlie Christian. Of course, it's been just about 15 years since we worked together to get the naming of Charlie Christian Avenue in, uh, in the east side of Bricktown. Let's hear it for Anita and everybody else who makes this happen. Yeah, go ahead. Anita, that's yours to keep. All right, well that concludes item three, and so we're at item four, presentations and discussion of fiscal year 23 proposed budget. We have presentations today from public works, utilities, and airports, uh, and everything today will be relative to the budget, and there's no, there are no votes. And from here, I will turn it over to the city manager. Thank you. So first up, we have Eric Winger, our public works director, present the public works budget. This is our last day of uh, presentations. As the mayor said, we have public works, utilities, and airports. And then at the end, Doug will present, our budget director, Doug Dowler, will present just a summary of the comments that we received uh, during that comment period for the budget. Eric? Eric Winger, public works director. Um, appreciate the opportunity today to come present the fiscal year 23 budget um, to the City Council. Um, we've had a lot of work on what you're going to see, and so my appreciation goes to a lot of my staff that are here. Um, we have Debbie Miller, we've got Billy Little, uh, we've got Mike Miller, and a host of others um, from the budget office um, who've been just instrumental in making sure that everything that's in your book um, is correct. So you'll find the public works uh, section starting on page C157. Um, 
So beginning there, um, when we look at Public Works, um, the mission of Public Works is to provide infrastructure construction and maintenance, private construction review and inspection, and emergency first response services to the City of Oklahoma City. Um, we've got nearly 400 employees that do this every day through the year, um, and, uh, and, and we're the fourth largest department in the city behind police, fire, and utilities. This is a, a breakdown of the different divisions that we have. Um, you'll see that our largest division is streets with 212 employees. Our smallest division is our traffic engineering division with 15. Um, you'll see the others that are included in there, and I'll go through this as a part of the presentation to break these out a little bit later. We start to look at how we address Oklahoma City, um, and we look at the size of the city, and this is really an infographic. Um, this is, uh, is something that Shannon Cox, that works with Public Works, as we display this information on OKCGov, as we go through social media, as we kind of tell our story. We maintain over 12,500 traffic signals. There's over 70,000 traffic control signs throughout the city, 75 miles of, of drainage channels that are maintained. Just as a fact, there's over a thousand miles of channel citywide, but we're able to do just 75 of those with our with our forces. Um, you have 3,500 miles of street, um, and it covers over 621 square miles. Looking at the line of business, these are the it, the divisions of Public Works. We've got administration, engineering, field services, project management, stormwater, streets, traffic drainage, and traffic management. And this is going to be a summary of our budget. So the first two columns are going to highlight last year, fiscal year 22. The next two columns are the fiscal year 23 totals. And then you'll see the percent change in that far right-hand column. We looked at some of the changes this year. You're going to notice there's a net reduction in positions. There's actually 17 positions that have been reduced. Um, what I will share with you is that the, no employees were lost. Um, we were able to move some employees as we address new programs that I'll explain in just a moment. Um, but there were no services lost by any the changes that we're presenting to you today. When you look at some, excuse me, one more time, back, sorry. <laughs> we look at the total operating expenditure, um, you're going to see it's 56.1 million. You'll see a non-operating and capital of 200 million for a total budget of 256 million. We look at that non-capital, or excuse me, the non-operating and the capital of 200. That includes things like the Better Street Safer City Sales Tax Program, our CIP, drainage utility, and then also impact fees. There's two categories of major budget change that we're presenting to you this year. There's personnel changes, and then we're also enhancing services. And when we look at those as we break those down on the next slide, these are the personnel changes. And so you're going to see that we've added positions, and then we've also moved or deleted some positions. So some of the ads you'll see, there's four in engineering, one in field services, one in project management. You're going to see the reduction in streets traffic drainage and again there were no persons that were actually removed from the program we've retained all employees we've simply made a programmatic change one in stormwater quality the reason for the major change in the streets traffic drainage is that the utility cut repair program which was formerly managed by public works directly is now going to be managed by a contractor so we we're able to take those positions that we're doing those utility cuts, we're going to be placing them into a new streets construction program to enhance the number of miles that we can actually resurface in a year while still actually taking care of the utility cuts through, through a contract. Um, we've also added additional pothole patching crews and then the new street construction program is one that'll actually be twofold. It'll do new asphalt streets, predominantly on rural roads, but then it's also going to do chip seal construction, which we've just not been fully staffed and able to do for the past couple of years. We look at the budget by funding source. It's the 256 million total budget. You'll see the, the largest portion of that budget is in the Better Street Safer City program at 102 million. As we go around, it also includes the capital improvement at 23 million, impact fees at 51, drainage utility at 32, other funds at 11.9, and the general fund at 35.8. We look at just the operating part of the budget. This is going to be for the personnel at 56 million. About half the employees in Public Works are streets program, and that's why nearly half of the budget is in the streets traffic drainage program at 24 million. You'll see the breakdown of traffic management, administration, engineering, field services, project management, and stormwater quality included on this slide as well. 
So these next few slides, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through each of the divisions, show you the total uh, number of personnel and the, and the proposed budget for each. So this is gonna be administration, a budget of 9.7 million at 24 positions. And this is where we do executive leadership, financial management, human resources. This is where we manage the GO bond expenditures. Uh, we also do GIS and mapping. We also do all of our public outreach out of this division. In our engineering division, it's 7.6 million and 32 positions. Um, this is where you find the drainage engineering and the technical review. This is where we also do drainage investigations. Now we are actually adding a number of positions in the engineering division to address a lot of the technical review concerns that have been shared with the department over the past year. Um, so we're adding um, several that I'm, I'll, I'll do a summary of those in just a moment. Um, we're also adding a senior project manager to the utility cut program. So since that's being moved to contracts, we'll have a manager that oversees those contracts as well. So this is a breakdown of the technical re review portion. Um, and one of the things that you'll notice is the number of plans that are actually reviewed in a year. So we're taking in about 100 new plans for private development a month. And so right now the plans reviewed are about 1,200. You'll see the actual number of permits is over 5,800. And those are everything from revocable permits to right-of-way permits to event permits. Things like that all come through the department. Looking at technical review a little bit further, um, this is a breakdown. The permits are highlighted in purple. The plans are highlighted in blue. And I think the thing that you'll notice is that the plans have been pretty consistent. Um, in fiscal year 17, we were at 721, but for the last three years, four years, we've been over 1,000 plans a year coming into our offices. You actually see the huge increase in the number of permits reviewed. This really has a lot to do with the increase in the number of revocable permits. Um, the department has just started to see significant increases, especially in uh, 5G technologies, a lot of the communication systems that are going in citywide for, for cellular and other wireless um, data. So uh, those permits have, uh, have been dramatic the past couple of years. So there is a metric that we watch very closely on how quickly we're able to turn those plan reviews around. And one of the goals of the department is to hit a three-week review period. Now, we've not been successful in doing that with the current staff. You'll see the past four years are summarized here. Um, the, our best year was in fiscal year 20, where we were able to do 62% of the plans in a three-week period. But it has dramatically decreased, one, just because of some staff turnover staff training needs, uh, but two, it's just the increase in permits and the number of plans that are coming in, and so we need to address that very quickly. So adding staff, we actually have four additional positions that are currently being engaged right now. We have an engineering assistant one, we have an engineering assistant two, we have an engineering aide, and we also have an additional simple engineer four um, that we're planning to add to this group that will actually almost double its size to address getting these numbers higher for next year. We move to the field services division. This is the division that does all the inspections and the construction inspections and the right of way. 4.5 million and 49 positions and the majority of the positions are the actual inspectors. And you'll see that the number of the inspections that are completed by this division are also high. So there's more than 8,000 right of way inspections that are completed. There's over 23,000 construction inspections and the value of the work that they're inspecting year to year is about $670 million worth of of private construction work. We look at inspection work orders, and this is again part of our leading for results and part of our tracking. Um, we can see that this is also remaining fairly consistent even through uh, the pandemic. Um, we've just seen a consistent delivery of projects in Oklahoma City. So the target for this year is over 500 inspection work orders are expected. Moving to project management, this is our contract uh, management positions. This is also our facilities project management and infrastructure project management. This is the group that actually manages the Better Street Safer City program, both the sales tax and the bond. Um, we are also um, managing other city projects, but it does not include the city's MAPS program, so it's completely separate from the public works effort. This is the, the dollar value of projects awarded year to year. Um, the reason I'm showing this is the bond is in blue and the Better Street Safer City sales tax is in purple. And you'll see that in calendar year 18, 19, and 20 was when the sales taxes were at their peak. Um, we were actually putting out between 170 and $180 million in those years, but you're actually starting to see those purple slices become smaller and smaller. So the sales tax has been fully collected. We actually anticipate having the last of the sales tax projects in construction by the end of the calendar year. 
It's possible there might be a street enhancement project that's running just a little bit late. We were able to actually use some city ARPA funds to enhance a couple of the projects, and so we're incorporating that scope of work now. But the majority of the sales tax projects are actually going to be completing um, here in the next year, or you can see the $4 million in calendar year 23. What you'll also see is that the bond programs remain pretty consistent. Um, our goal right now is $110 million a year moving forward. That's really just limited only just by the, by the ability to sell bonds and the mill levy that we currently have in Oklahoma City. So, um, but uh, you're going to see that that blue line will extend out just each year as we come back and, and share the status. Moving to stormwater management, budget of 3.7 million, 31 positions. Uh, this is our environmental water quality. It's our household hazardous waste program. It's also public outreach and permitting. This is another infographic that, that shows the stormwater um, year in review. So this is going to be for last year. Um, you're going to see just the number of different activities that they were able to complete. So there was over 695,000 pounds of household hazardous waste collected in the last year, completed nearly 10,000 construction inspections, removed over 7 million pounds of floatable debris out of the Oklahoma River. Um, they distributed 374 rain barrels last year. We're on track this year for 600 rain barrels as a part of the city's program. And we had 983 volunteer participants for our Adopt-A-Street Adopt program. This is our household hazardous waste facility. For those that may not be familiar, this is located at 1621 South Portland. It's open Tuesday through Saturday. Um, Again, I mentioned the amount of waste that was collected of nearly 700,000 pounds. We actually have agreements with eight other municipalities that include Edmond, Village, Yukon, Shawnee, Moore, El Reno, War Acres, and Bethany, and we take on some of their waste as well. We collected over 76,000 pounds of waste from those uh, participants. Um, we just finished our annual spring event held on April 10th with 454 participants on that event. And these are the totals that were collected there. We, these are things that we're not able to take into the facility on a normal day, um, but we took in over 625 pounds of prescription medication, 135,000 pounds of tires, and over 16,000 pounds of computers. And this helped keep those materials out of the landfills. So a highly successful event. We look at public outreach. Um, you'll notice that we, we do a number of workshops. Um, we do a newsletter that has over 2,700 subscriptions. Um, we also have a pre-K through 6 program. Um, the mascot that you see on the right-hand side of the slide, this is Wayne Drop. Um, he reaches out to our, our youth in Oklahoma City. It's part of trying to catch them early, and, and again, it's a streams and, and creeks program, just keeping those clean. Um, we reached out to over 2,300 students this past year with online teaching videos and take-home experiments. Moving to our largest division, our streets, traffic, and drainage division, uh, we are adding crews. So even though there's a net reduction, we're actually adding four crew members and increasing the pothole patching program. We're also adding a unit operations supervisor that's going to help maintain the new streets enhancement program that I mentioned that's going to increase the miles of resurfacing and chip seal in this next year. Um, again, it is our largest program at 24 million and 212 positions. So with the street maintenance program, with Better Street Safer City sales tax, with 2017 bond and a lot of the emphasis on improving city streets, we are still tracking an increase in the pavement condition index citywide. You'll see back in fiscal year 14, the PCI of Oklahoma City was just a 63. And this is on a scale of 100, with zero being the worst and 100 being a brand new street. But our city average over the past several years, especially with the investment from those programs, we're actually at a 70, looking to be a 71 in the next year. So marked improvement every year. We look at the miles resurfaced. Uh, this graph is real similar to the sales tax and bond graph that I showed. Our peak years were those years where we actually had the, the sales tax underway. And that's, you'll see that 137. Now that we're leveling into just the bond program going forward, our goal is to do a 100 miles of new street resurfacing each year, and, and that's what you're seeing as evidence here with a fiscal year target for 23. So with improved streets, one of the graphs that's really good to show is the decrease in the number of potholes that we've seen over the past few years. So you'll see we had a peak year in fiscal year 15 of over 100,000 potholes, but you're going to notice for the past several years we've hovered somewhere between 50 and 60,000. Our average used to be about 80,000. So as we continue to maintain those, those streets, um, as we have fixed the city's worst streets, we're seeing fewer potholes. It's good to see this number come down. We expect it to drop even more as we finish more streets in Oklahoma City. 
These are just some photos of the crews at work. Um, top photo is the pothole patching program. Uh, bottom photo is the street resurfacing program that I mentioned that we're looking to enhance and do more miles of streets citywide. We also have the traffic signal and replacement program. We also do traffic striping. And then we also do drainage and mowing. Um, a lot of the miles of drainage um, that I mentioned, the 75 miles, uh, we also maintain a lot of the city's detention ponds that are public. The one thing that we do not do is mow right of way. So that is a question that comes in quite often as the grass begins to grow in the summer, especially in the rural areas. Um, it is the responsibility of the private property owner to do right of way mowing. Now we do clear the grass that's around a regulatory sign. We we'll also clear the grass that's around a corner where there might be a site obstruction. But as we just look at the miles and miles of, of rural city streets, it is the private property owner's responsibility to take care of those mowings just as it is in the urban areas of Oklahoma City. So this is going to be our last division, our traffic management, our smallest division, traffic engineering and transportation services, 1.7 million in 15 positions. The predominantly part of the program that the traffic engineering division does is the traffic commission. Um, they also review all the traffic plans in Oklahoma City. They take care of things like signal timings and other advancements in our, in our streetlight um, system. So as we look at fiscal year 23 and our projected outlook, um, we're looking over 100 miles of street improvement probably 60,000 potholes to be repaired, 21 street system impact fee projects to be awarded. So these are gonna be the impact fees and the, and the monies that have been collected from that system. 1,200 infrastructure plans reviewed, 32,000 right-of-way inspections, likely 700,000 pounds of household hazardous waste collected also at the HHW. 600 rain bar barrels to be distributed and 2,000 stormwater permits reviewed and all by 400 dedicated hardworking public works employees. So. I appreciate your time this morning. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have about the Public Works budget for this upcoming year. Great presentation. Uh, I really like the projected outlook for 2023, the different factors there. But um, in going to page C167, uh, we all get a lot of calls about streets, traffic, and drainage maintenance. And I noticed that um, the number of employees went down by 24, C167. And, and I think you may have answered it in part, but by moving the utility cut repair personnel, was that part of the reason we had that? I mean, we're not losing people, they were just moving to a different department. So they're gonna be retained still in our streets traffic drainage division. So what we had in public works was we had a high number of vacancies and by creating the new program and pushing it into the contract, we're able to reduce these that were actually doing the utility cuts into other vacant and similar positions. And so we retained them within the department to do similar functions just not the utility cut program, but we're gonna maintain both programs, so no loss of service. Great, thank you very so, much. So yeah, and the, the positions that were eliminated basically are replaced with contract. Mm -hmm. So there's a contractor will be doing that same level of work. That's what he's saying before, it was like services won't go down because a contractor will do that work. If we had enough vacancies, all those people were able to move into other positions. Okay, good, thank you. Hey, <clears throat> Eric, uh, again, also thank you for the presentation. And thank you and everybody in your office for the great work that you do. And these comments I'm gonna make <clears throat> are not pointed towards you. It's just that there's examples from your department. So I know you're always trying to uh, achieve the highest quality. I know Craig is always concerned with getting the highest quality. But the fact is we've got examples where that doesn't always happen. And, and I'll eventually come to a point, and I hope to keep it under three minutes, uh, as to a suggestion that I think would be helpful. So uh, last week I got a call from a, uh, a homeowner whose property is around the intersection of uh, Odom Road and South Harvey Avenue. And a couple of months ago, they had called in several times to our action center, couldn't get any kind of response. And that action center aspect is going to be an important part of this overall discussion that I'm going to have. And I'm, I'll eventually come to a suggestion. You'll just have to be patient with me. So they called in. There was a pretty big hole at that intersection, and it needed to be filled. Well, <clears throat> after contacting me after they attempted to get through the action line, we got in touch and they did feel it, but what happened is 
they didn't level it off at street level. So there's about a 12 inch bubble now instead of a 12 inch hole, which is just as much of a problem. And they've set a cone out there just so people will avoid the area. And it, you can see tire tracks where somebody had driven through it and it messed it up and anyway. And then <clears throat> another example, and again, I'm going to come to an point eventually, where one of our neighbors had had the road uh, eaten away in front of their driveway. And so I took it upon myself to call this order in. And uh, I happened to be home when the supervisor drove by to look at it, and I was talking to him, very polite. All your employees are just very polite, great to work with. And he said, yeah, we can fix this, but in six to eight weeks, it's going to wash away, and we'll have to come back out here again. And I said, isn't there some permanent type fixture? Granted, our streets are in bad condition. They look like the backs of alligators, you know, with all the cracks where the water has eaten away at that. He goes, well, that's the best we can do. And I said, well, we've got some potholes just down at this corner, too. He goes, well, we can't do all of these. We can't fix everything. I said, OK, well, let's focus on this. And here's kind of the frustrating part. They came back out, and they laid new asphalt in, but they only did it for the width of the driveway. And this hole, this area that had been eaten away, extended well into the next neighbor's uh, property. Fortunately, it wasn't in front of their driveway. But all they fixed was just the portion in, in front of the driveway. And <clears throat> my concern is the people, either they're overworked, they don't have enough time to address all of these issues properly, or an attitude of, well, we did the bare minimum and that's sufficient, which I don't want to think that's the case, but it happens. You know, that culture can uh, get into any kind of an organization. And then moving into another area, uh, in Valley Green, this was about a year ago that we've spoken about this previously. There's a bridge that goes through that uh, neighborhood and we're responsible for keeping that bridge clear of any debris. We had allowed debris to accumulate, and again, they made multiple calls into the action center to uh, make us aware of the situation. And so the normal 100% clear path had been reduced, I would guess, somewhere between 20 and 25, maybe 30% of the water was actually cleared up and it was creating flooding when there was heavy, rain, heavy rains in multiple yards. So the point I'm trying to make is there are problems in the way we're delivering services, and these types of services fall into our basic responsibility. You know, governments are formed to provide services that individuals on their own can't infrastructure, streets, water, sewer, as well as providing police, fire, and in our case, IMSA protection. We're failing at doing it at the very highest quality that we, we could be performing these services. Part of the problem is our action center. Currently, there is no way that our action center can monitor the calls in terms of what was ultimately uh, determined when people call in with a problem. They say, we've looked, there's just no software out on the market that could accommodate us, which, you know, that may be true. Now, Amazon receives 4,000 orders a minute. That equates to over close to six million orders a day. They ship out close to two million packages a day. Any point in time, any minute of the day, they'll tell you exactly the status of each order and the status of each package. 
<clears throat> all these systems are basically driven from an Excel spreadsheet format. All of your sophisticated accounting programs are. All we would have to do is keep track of, by columns, this goes into public works, this goes into uh, uh, our water services, this goes into the police, whatever. And the Action Center could maintain the status of all these calls that are coming in. I mean, if Amazon can do 4,000 a minute, we can do a few hundreds a day. And I'm sure other members of this council get complaints when they've tried to go through the system, the Action Line Center, and no results occur, or less than expected results occur. What I'm proposing is that we create an Office of Quality Control. Now this office, I mean, this concept of continuous improvement has been in the private sector since the 1980s. If we were a for-profit entity, I don't think we would last a year with the results that are occurring at this point. Competition would just say, hey, they're just not able to meet this responsibility. Let us come in and take care of you. That's what we saw through the 80s and 90s. And so this concept of continuous improvement is a fixture in the private sector we need an office of quality control who's not trying to be punitive, but when they see instances like this, they'll work with supervisors, employees, department heads to try to identify methods, procedures uh, to make sure this type of result doesn't occur in the future. And so I would request that we include enough in our budget to have a Office of Quality Control. One thing I would uh, want to mention too is that it needs to be separate from any of the other government offices. I mean, it's, they're going to review the entire operations of the city and they need to report either directly to the city council or since some of their work would be similar to what some of our internal audit functions are in terms of management type reviews, they could be housed in the office of the internal auditor's office. But their focus is to identify problems and getting back to the Action Center, one of their first projects is to find a, ma a way to monitor calls coming into the Action Center to see how they're being resolved and make sure that every call that comes in is being resolved in some way. Because right now, once that call gets sent to that particular department, our action center has no way of keeping track of it. Again, even if it's one person assigned to an Excel spreadsheet, there's a way to track that and to follow up with it. That's all I'm asking for, is that we create this office of quality control that office is going to review all the services we provide and report back to the council. And again, not in a punitive manager, manage, in a manner, but in a manner that's going to improve the overall quality of services that the city provides. Thank you. Yeah, I'd just say that, that you know, we do, like I think you mentioned it, that we have with the city auditor's office, we have performance audits that they conduct and they develop a performance audit plan every year. So there's some of that that happens in that case. We also have a position we created a couple of years ago, we haven't filled at this point, that's a chief innovation officer that would create an office of innovation that would allow for, you know, one side is looking at performance of current structure and what's there. Innovation is looking at different ways that we can do things, you know, trying to be proactive with identifying opportunities. I think we've got the capacity within those two. I need to, I'm trying to get my assistant city manager position filled right now, and then we need to move towards that office of innovation that would pull together resources from various departments to be able to look at creative ways that we can solve problems like this that we face uh, within the organization. So it's definitely something that we can focus on. Well, no, I understand, Craig, and I appreciate you sharing those. I agree, this internal audit 
department has done uh, some very nice uh, engagements that have resulted in significant savings in terms of time, like in the Office of Licensing and Permitting. Uh, they've done some great jobs, and other areas have benefited from that. The issue with that is they select a particular department and uh, periodically go in and look at certain issues. This person or this office, and I'm thinking initially be one person, would be doing this continuously. And again, it's not in a punitive manner, but in a manner to look at the procedures, the methodologies that are used in constantly working on that. And I agree, some of these issues would cross over into the Office of Innovation. But the fact is, we've been talking about the Office of Innovation for quite some time. I'm suggesting this Office of Con Quality Control needs to be a priority and needs to be filled within the next few months. Because, again, I'm not talking in terms of not essential services. These are essential services. That's why we're formed, is to provide infrastructure, police, fire protection. And getting back to the Action Center, again, to passively look to see if there's some program out on the market is not the proper response. And this Office of Quality Control wouldn't take a passive approach to finding problems. Especially if we brought someone from the private sector, they recognize every day that we delay in making these necessary changes to improve the quality of service, we're at risk. We're at risk from a private sector in terms of competition overtaking us. But we're at risk from a governmental perspective in that our citizens begin to lose confidence in our abilities. And like in Ward 5, most people I encounter have greater confidence like in Cleveland County to address some of their concerns than they do in the city of Oklahoma City just because of experiences like this. And I'm only getting issues that have have not been addressed by our council staff. They probably deal with thousands of issues and they're able to resolve them. I'm saying now's the time to begin looking at all of our policies and procedures and methods used in all of our departments and see is there a way to improve the quality of service that we're providing to the citizens of Oklahoma City. Yeah, and Zach Nash is here with uh, Public Information Office, and they have the Action Center um, within their department. You can talk about some of the things that we've got working right now. Yes, Councilman, thank, thanks for the questions. And, you know, I will say that within the last couple of years, Eric has put in a team, Andrea Shelton and Shannon Cox, to really prioritize that engagement between the resident and things that are coming through the Action Center. As you know, the Action Center passes stuff to departments, and we try to follow up. Some of those, when they get past the departments, they close those out, and our staff can't see where they are without doing the footwork to follow, the, follow up on those. Right. But we are looking, um, actively looking at uh, platforms, customer service platforms in the Action Center to improve that. Uh, one of those is in, is in the budget, uh, proposed budget, with our app replacement, which we're looking at a way to improve that interaction between our resident and our frontline uh, action center staff. So we are doing some things. We know that there are some, some issues that we need to improve, especially when you know, public works is our number one, you know, those issues that are coming in yes. uh, consistently, as you know from our, our, our resident survey as well. But we are looking at ways to uh, add uh, functionality through technology, as well as we just uh, hired two more additional staff to take those calls and work with departments. So we, we know that there are ways to improve things, and we're working towards that. 
Zach, and I appreciate that. And I appreciate your efforts. I know you are concerned about these matters. I know everybody in this room is concerned about these matters. I'm just trying to encourage us to move along and look at adding a person whose sole responsibility is to evaluate all of the processes, all of the methodologies that are currently being used and seeing if there's ways to improve that. I think now's the time to do this. I don't know why we would delay in trying to improve the overall services we provide to citizens in all of the areas that we have contacts with them. And again, it's great to pursue a situation where citizens could initiate a call and that they could see the progress of that particular uh, work order, let's, let's use that term. That'd be great, but I'm simply asking, let's have one department, whether it's the Action Center or some other department, to monitor the progress of all those. And this hasn't just developed overnight. As you said, past couple of years, uh, at some point, and excuse me for bringing in these concepts from the private sector, but it's the environment I grew up in, at some point, you've got to say, enough's enough, we need a solution today. You know, and that's all I'm bringing to this point, especially the, now that we're looking at a budget. So thanks to you, Zach, thank you, Eric, and all your staff. I'm not saying anybody in this room is the problem. Don't get me wrong on that. I know you all want to achieve the same thing I'm trying to achieve. I'm just trying to provide encouragement to everybody here and the people that may be listening that we need to develop a sense of urgency and not allow just okay to be the goal in anything that we provide to the citizens. We should try to provide as high of quality of work as we can. Thank you. <clears throat> May I ask, um, just kind of a follow up. I think my only quibble with Councilman's closing remarks there was you said simply that it was more simple to create a new department than it is to do the first thing you mentioned, which is actually the request I have. And that request is, and maybe Zach spoke a bit to this, but um, yeah, in my time on council, I, I've experienced kind of a frustration in it, and I hear it from Ward 2 residents that when they submit a request via text or call or through the app to the Action Center that there's, they don't receive a, um, um, kind of what you're talking about, Councilman, right? Like a, uh, the status and then the when it's complete. And we just heard Zach say because of these departmental, uh, some of the departments don't uh, let um, Zach's team know. But we, I think that is a thing that we could do. And I do think that is the more simple ask. I'm not saying do or do not create whatever department you're asking for, but I'm saying it seems to me the more simple ask here that I'm asking for at least is I would like for our resident and I'd like as a council person to be able to um, track the status and to know when something's closed out. I can't tell you how many times someone has reached out to the Ward 2's office and said to us they submitted something to the Action Center and um, they have no idea what's what's happened and so then what happens is council staff we go in and we find out and we have to call a department um, uh, employee who's working doing diligent work elsewhere on something we have to follow up and be like hey can you look into this for us and then lo and behold it's been fixed but there was no update to the resident or to the respective ward you follow what I'm saying okay. so that is something that I think to David's point would be very very helpful so I'd like to know like kind of where we are in that. So it sounds like we're heading kind of in that direction. And I just think that would be an important thing. 
So uh, we, we do agree that managing those resident expectations and when stuff comes in to, for have them to track down the process, that we received it, that it's been assigned to crews, and that it's been fixed uh, is really important, one, for resident confidence. And I, I will say that in the past, we, we've done a better job at that and just some processes have changed. And I think that we can work with Public Works and our other departments to rethink how we can better uh, streamline that process. And so residents and staff, because what, what you also get is when uh, you get duplications. So when someone reports something and it's automatically closed out, uh, somebody else could then call council staff or call Eric directly, and that's why he really put in Andre and Shannon and put them on there is to, is to improve those uh, resident responses, right? When things either get duplicated or come to council staff and Debbie and Boyd and James kind of follow up on that, but we can work together to probably improve uh, you know, those automatic responses throughout the process. It's in, the technology's in place. Mm. We just need to work together to then turn those back on and figure out a way where our systems can work together, which I think we can do. And just kind of, if you could just keep, at least I know my office, keep us posted as council as we do achieve this kind of result you're talking about. The other thing, and I'm gonna sound like the oldest person who's never used a computer in their life, but I tried this weekend to, uh, on OKC Connect, which I love the app, I've literally done like video of me using the app and put it on Instagram. That's not the old person part. That's actually the young millennial figuring out technology part. The old person part that's never used a computer for me um, is when I, it, I tried to submit a request over the weekend um, and it, um, it said could not submit the request. And I ended up texting it but it just seemed like you have, we have this really great app, right? That has all these different departments. You can swipe, you can press this. And so it's all set up to be able to like do what it needs to do. But then when you hit submit, it just said could not submit the request. Now again, I was able to text it, but what was embarrassing on my part was again, I'm kind of, I hope my mom is watching, I'm sure she is. And of course I'm aware that there are folk who are older who are probably way more uh, technologically inclined than I am. It's just that sometimes when she and I talk about technology, it's kind of funny. Um, but I was, what was embarrassing though was that what the situation was, was there was an oil spill in a, um, an alley downtown from behind a restaurant and someone had posted that they had been hurt biking through that alley. And I was about to tell them to just go onto the app. And, and then I was like, no, I'll just do it myself. I'm the council person. And I'm really glad I didn't ask them to do it because then I encountered what I did. So I don't know what that is. So our, we, we actually submitted, there is a known issue with our app right now and it is down and IT is working with our vendor. But we share your frustration and that's why in, this, in your budget, uh, in this year's budget, there is a proposed replacement because we know that there are some, some issues with that app and there have been. And you know, that's one thing that we, we don't want to do is like tell people to go to the app and then it doesn't work and then you can't follow up on things. And so that one issue where you can't submit is, um, is a known issue that IT is working on. But I, I will say just like you know, our texting feature and our, we try to give people all the ways that they can, but we need all those to work. And so we do know that there's some also improvements to that app, and that's why we submitted that in the budget with IT, and that's a partnership with all departments that use the Action Center. And so we, we do need to replace that, rethink how we, we provide that service to residents. Well, I think that's great. And again, I, I was happy that I was able to text the issue. It's not like Action Center wasn't there. It's just this, this app was so close. So I'm really glad to hear you all are heading in that direction, and that wasn't a user, <laughs> user problem. So thank you. I like you're doing a great job since you're not even on the agenda today. Thank you. <laughs> you were not prepared for this. If I may bring it back to Public Works, Eric, the PCI uh, chart that you shared, um, what, uh, how does that rank nationally? I mean, how, how, 71, 70, 71, like how does that stack up? You know, I should have brought that information. Um, we have done some city comparisons in years past. I do know that Oklahoma City is probably in line with most average cities. Um, if not, maybe slightly ahead, but I'm gonna need to bring that information back to you. Well, but, it's a great message. I mean, you know, yeah. we have to, we have made progress and we need yeah. to share that with the public. 
Any other questions on public works? I had a couple. Um, as we're looking at replacing those, those um, positions for the contractor program for the street utility cuts, uh, my question to you, as far as the contractor program, um, how are we ensuring that we're, are we using subcontractors, um, those who are already in bid sync? And if those are yeses, how are we ensuring that we're gathering and bringing more folks um, that probably have not been engaged in this process to be able to be a part of this contractor program if there is an opportunity to do so? So in the utility cut program, which was an in-house and we're moving it to contract, we've actually already bid the contracts to pre-qualified contractors who are on contract now so they can receive those work orders from the city. Um, so um, we, uh, the pre-qualification review board uh, meets once a month and can review new applications. So if there is interest, if there is a contractor that's a paving contractor, um, we actually have categories of work that are all sizes of different jobs the city would let um, from entry level type work to complete street reconstruction and resurfacing. Um, but we can receive those applications and work with small business. Not a part of the presentation that I mentioned today, but something that we are engaging. One of our positions is a local business utilization uh, liaison. Um, we're actually in the interview process currently to get that person engaged. But once that program, which was already supported by the council, is underway and we have this individual in that seat, um, we will be doing a lot more proactive reaching out, um, looking at workshops, looking at opportunities for a central point of contact, really just for small and disadvantaged businesses that are looking to do work with the city. So that position, unfortunately, is just not filled today. Um, we've had a little bit of difficulty getting somebody qualified in that position, but we are in the interview process right now. So I expect that that will be in place here in just the next few short months. Okay, thank you. And that was actually um, going to be another part of my question because as we look at this uh, local business utilization program and also the MAPS program that we want to ensure that we're using uh, local businesses in that process, it seems as if we would want to, in my opinion, figure out how to grow uh, that specific area, not just with one liaison, but probably a, a f at least a few people uh, or a department to do that. And, and one of the things I know we've talked about this before, even in MAPS, um, as we were having the full MAPS discussion for MAPS 4, we know um, in the initial MAPS, and you and I have discussed this too, uh, when in previous Councilwoman Johnson uh, was, was in this position, she helped to form that type of um, connection to the community and the MAPS program for those local businesses to be a part of it. So it's, I know um, in my opinion, it's kind of overdue, if, if you will, since we are already starting the, the process of, of what MAPS is doing, MAPS 4 is already doing. Uh, but it seems to me, and I could be very wrong, but having to find the information and make sure that community is, is getting at least some of it um, it's it's kind of difficult to do. So if there's a way for us to do that, I would I would like for us to just look into it a little further. And my other question that I have for you is, as we look at the technical review uh, pertaining to the engineering, that's where I've been having a lot of phone calls uh, pertaining to folks trying to have their 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 plans reviewed, their documents reviewed and the turnaround time for that. So as we're looking uh, at this position, what will now be the expectation of the time of response? Are, is it gonna be lessened or are we still at the four to five weeks? So we, you, you we the council, and we've, we've been very active making some changes in our technical review program over the past couple of months. We've met with commercial developers, um, We've listened. Um, so in addition to the positions that we hope to actually help reduce that time and our target again is to get to three weeks, we're currently at five to six weeks. We were at the beginning of the year eight to nine weeks. So we've already seen a significant reduction, yet we want to get from that five to six down to three, and we think the additional positions will help us do that. We've also already made some internal changes. Um, we had, uh, we as a staff have been putting holds on building permits waiting for engineering plans to be fully reviewed and approved. We're no longer holding those building permits, which has also sped up the process for contractors to get to work. Um, and we're working those processes simultaneously. 
Um, we're looking at some other internal changes as well with the way we review plans to try to speed that process. So it's not just the staffing. We've actually made some internal operational changes already. Um, the developer response has been very positive with those changes. We actually met with them just last week, some of the leadership from those commercial developers. Um, they've appreciated that. And then we're going to meet again in probably about two months and do another follow-up to make sure that we continue to, to do better. Thank you. And then my, this is my last question. As um, we talked about the street resurfacing, um, and my, my specific guess is pertaining to when we have those, those cuts, utility cuts that we have, or residential um, drainage issues that may happen and occur, what is the expectation time uh, between that fix from utilities to public works to go back and resurface that street? Um, and the reason I ask is because just passing through some neighborhoods, I see some of the, where you know the utilities have been repaired, but there's just like a cone and we're waiting for it to be fixed. So I think the expectation is, is asked for residents, but it would be nice to just have that public as far as for folks to, to understand just because you're seeing this cone um, maybe a week or two that we are, there is an expectation as far as the, the date for that to be fixed or finished. So when the utility cuts was an in-house program, uh, the goal was to have those repaired within 30 days. But it really depends on the number of utility cuts that are active at any one time as to the true response time. Um, what's unfortunate is when it rains heavy like it has done in the last week, we get a lot of shrink and swell of the soil. We're likely to see a lot more utility breaks that require cut and cut repairs than we do when it's, say, not as inclement weather. Um, we see that also with the snow and the ice. Um, so the good news is I think the response times have been reasonable with, with the limited dry, but now that we're getting into a rainy season, we're likely to see that go up and the response time's taking longer. Um, with the contractor, we're looking to put some performance measures in the contract. Um, we've got some internal goals to have that a lot less than 30 days, but we haven't really started the program yet pending the budget approval. Um, but our expectation with contractors would be to get that maybe down to 14 days or less um, with the contractor's assistance. But I think we'll scale the contractor up. Um, we're also going to be paying a competitive price for rapid response to get those done. So that's one of the reasons for the change, too, is that we simply weren't able to keep up with just our public works in-house crews. We needed to move that back to contracting where we could, we could grow that. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Eric. Appreciate that. Welcome. Appreciate your work. Chris Browning, Utilities Director, is going to be presenting the Utilities Budget. Good morning, Chris Browning, Utilities Director. Before I get started, I would like to thank Vanessa and her team for putting this budget together. As you'll see in a few minutes, it's, it's a very large budget, very comprehensive, and they worked very, very hard to put this together. So thank you so much for your work. Uh, the utility uh, budget begins on page C-169 of the budget book. So our mission is pretty simple. We provide three essential services uh, throughout central Oklahoma safeguard public health, public safety, the environment, and to enable economic prosperity for the region. Several years ago, utilities developed core business initiatives that everything ties back to, everything in our budget, everything we do each and every day ties back to at least one of these initiatives, and we developed them to be in line with the uh, council priorities. So uh, first of all, the safety, we're responsible for, for providing a safe work environment for employees and the public, since we do most of our work out in the public. Customer service, we're committed to providing quality customer service, meeting expectations for effective service delivery to all customers. Securing additional water supply and reliably delivering the water to central Oklahoma is one of our paramount initiatives. Aqua will continue efforts to maintain and upgrade our infrastructure to enhance the reliability and resiliency of our utility systems to minimize the likelihood of service disruptions. Aqua consistently follows strong financial management principles and has obtained the highest available credit rating for debt issuances. And finally, we are committed to full compliance with regulations and directives from all regulatory agencies. So this is a summary of our funding sources for FY23. 
Uh, service charges uh, total $387 million, where water is $203 million, wastewater is $119 million, and solid waste is $65 million. So that's the money we, we expect to uh, bring in this year. Debt construction funds will be $322 million, uh, $248 million is uh, water, and $74 million will be wastewater. Withdrawals from cash reserves total $34 million. And then other funding sources total $17 million, including system development charges, uh, billing service fee chargebacks, interest miscellaneous revenues, and flow fees. Our funding uses for the year, the capital improvement program this year will total $483 million, or $351 million is water. Wastewater is $127 million, and solid waste management is $5 million. That's primarily for their trucks and the carts. City utility operations is $109 million. That's primarily for the employees and some of the materials and supplies that we buy uh, to operate our, our treatment facilities and to maintain and repair the water and sewer pipelines. Then debt service is $54 million. Trust operations is $44 million. Um, that is the, to cover the franchise fee and lease payments to the city. Uh, professional services, including banking, legal, or trust engineer, financial advisors, and billing services. And then support services that we've already talked about that a bit, pavement repair. Uh, mowing services where we have parks and rec mow all of our facilities throughout the city. Uh, fuel, water solids handling, uh, landscape and driveway repair services, and software licensing and support. And then finally, well, and, and we also have uh, 39 billion for trash uh, collection, bulky removal and recycling services. Uh, we have two uh, very large O&M contracts, one for operating our wastewater treatment facilities, it's $21 million. And then we have um, other uses totaling $11 million, including uh, cash deposits to reserves, the McGee Creek operations, and our non-rate expenses. So the utility operations uh, this year uh, has, a, has a total change of 4.5% over last year, which is roughly $5 million. Salary adjustments of 1.2 million. Uh, we're asking for 24 additional positions this year, totaling 2.3 million. And then the city chargebacks and miscellaneous charges of $1.5 million. This is the summary of our utility operations. We have nine divisions um, totaling $115 million. That would be in, a, in the city budget for the year. And we're proposing to have a total of 808 positions this year. As you can see from this chart, the growth of our utility and the growth of the citizens that we serve is outpacing the number of employees we have. Back in 2020, the FY21 budget, we, we cut 20 positions. Uh, we weren't really sure what COVID impacts, the financial impacts would be on the utility, so we cut 20 positions to make sure that we were covered for whatever losses we may incur during COVID. So we're gonna to ask to restore some of those positions to increase our service level uh, to our customers. So in customer service, we would like to add three assistant superintendents for business continuity and succession planning. Those assistant superintendents will manage the day-to-day -day operations of customer service, solid waste management, and the water quality, um, the area of plant operations and laboratory operations. The escalated uh, customer concerns and business matters consume most of the superintendent's uh, time each and every day. So what we'd like to do is have these three assistants 
serve at the day-to-day -day capacity so that the, the superintendents can evaluate the performance of, of their respective operations, develop plans, and implement those plans so that we can enhance the level of service that we provide to our customers. Secondly, uh, we would like to add seven customer service representatives. We, we cut, I believe, 12 back in 2020. We would like to add seven back. Uh, right now, um, our call time has increased from four and a half minutes to over six minutes, and that's because of a couple of things. First of all, we're getting more calls today than in the past. Secondly, the calls are more complex than they were in the past. We have a lot of people needing to set up payment uh, um, accounts where they can make payments each month to cover the, the, their um, water bills for the last 12 months where they haven't been able to pay those, those water bills. So we're spending a lot of time doing that. Secondly, we're spending time trying to work with federal government to bring in some money so that we can help those folks pay the bills. So the call wait times are longer than they were in the past. So the, um, the goal is to try to answer the call in about 30 seconds, not more than 30 seconds. Now, we automatically answer the calls pretty quickly, but we want a, a customer service rep on that call with a customer within 30 seconds. Right now, we're um, well above that. As you can see, we have not been able to meet our goal uh, for a couple of years now um, because of more calls. We get over 500,000 calls in the call center annually. And so with the, with a fewer number of customer service representatives, the, the call wait time has increased and our ability to meet our, our goal of, meeting, of, of answering the call within 30 seconds, 90% of the time uh, is not possible today. Hopefully with these seven additional, we'll be able to get closer to that, to that level of service. And then we also um, cut two refuse collector positions in 2020. We'd like to add those two back. Those are in our bulky trash collection so that we can keep up with service demands. What we found during COVID is a lot of people cleaned out their garages and their closets, and they did a lot more landscaping. So our bulky collection was, was slower than we would expect, but we are uh, back to normal today. But with these two additional positions, we should be able to handle the peaks better as well. And then we would like to add a revenue auditor. Um, over the next 10 years, we'll issue about 10 about $2 billion in debt. Um, we also, with our financial management group, administer a commercial paper program so that we can award projects through a line of credit, a $350 million line of credit, and then we convert that into long-term debt as we, as we spend the money. So that with a commercial paper program, we can, it's like a, a, a credit card where we can pay back what we spend, and then when we hit about $100 million, we can go ahead and convert that to long-term debt. So we save our, our ratepayers quite a bit of money with that program. And then um, the Oklahoma Water Resources Board Loan Management Program, uh, federal funding opportunities, uh, re revenue bond issuances, uh, the Tinker uh, Project, uh, that one uh, is going very well. Uh, but over the next 10 years, we will have about $110 million in debt just for, for Tinker. Uh, so we, we need to be able to manage that. And as, as you all can imagine, managing contracts and, and procurement through federal agencies is a little bit more complicated than what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. So this additional revenue auditor will help us manage that huge uh, capital budget and our uh, financial management obligations day-to-day -day as well. So in the area of system reliability, um, we have had some significant increases um, this year for repair, for equipment, for supplies, and for uh, chemicals. So we're asking to increase the budget by about $1.2 million to cover those expenses for the next fiscal year. We would like to add a division. We have uh, a technology group within the utilities uh, department that is, has a very wide breadth and very wide depth. Uh, so what we want to do is add uh, a, a utilities uh, business system manager to manage the new division and add a systems analyst to help with our GIS program. 
the initiatives within that group currently include uh, billing system improvements, integration solutions for permitting GIS, billing and asset management, mobile workforce management, water system pressure management, facilities asset management, laboratory information systems management, commercial industrial pretreatment, and then our electronic uh, program management system that we're getting ready to roll out. In addition to that, we need to automate uh, the systems out at Tinker Air Force Base, and so this, this group will also manage the SCADA system at Tinker Air Force Base. In regulatory compliance, uh, additional programs have recently been introduced by EPA uh, in, the water, in the Wastewater Quality Division, so we'll need to address those initiatives. The industrial pretreatment program includes pharmaceutical, dental, marijuana, and industrial customer monitoring for over 4,800 facilities within Oklahoma City under the new EPA rules that were promulgated in 2020. So we would like to add a pretreatment coordinator to manage the industrial pretreatment group and the fifth environmental unit specialist to manage the day-to-day -day permitting within that group. So with Tinker Air Force Base, we signed the contract to operate their water sewer system in September of 2020. We've, we, we took over the actual operation of the base in November of 21, and that program is going very, very well. We would like to add an, uh, an engineering projects manager. We borrowed a civil engineer four position from our engineering group to start the management of the Tinker Air Force Base contract. But this position, uh, the um, engineering projects manager is, is a, a better suited position to manage the day-to-day, -to, -day, to manage the contractor that we hired to operate the base water sewer system and to help coordinate the $110 million capital program for the next 10 years. And that will enable us to move the civil engineer four position back into our engineering group to help us manage the other capital projects that we're proposing over the next 10 years. So now I'd like to give you a, a highlight of our capital program. As I said earlier, it's $483 million. The, the, the biggest component is the uh, second Atoka pipeline. There's nine segments within that pipeline. Uh, we have awarded contracts for two of those. We're going to award another segment uh, in June, and then we anticipate awarding two a year thereafter. The uh, project estimate for FY23 for the Atoka pipeline is $241 million. And then the neighborhood water and sewer line replacement projects, we have some of our pipelines that are approaching 100 years old, and we're systematically replacing those pipelines. So in FY23, we're planning uh, to replace uh, approximately $28 million worth of those, those aged lines. And then we have kicked off an automated meter reading um, program where we're automating all of our meters throughout the city. The program is, is $55 million. In FY23, about $7 million of those will be, be replaced. It, it helps us to read meters in, in times where we have adverse weather conditions so that we can electronically pick up those, those reads where we don't delay the billing. And also, it eliminates uh, the potential of a misread. So you can imagine uh, a meter reader bends down, they, they collect a, a meter read, which is about 10 digits. They get up, they walk 100 feet, they do it again. They do that over 400 times a day. So as you can imagine, they're going to make a mistake from time to time. The, the automatic meter reading system totally eliminates that. The system cannot get a misread, so that helps us with customer service and it also helps us to get the correct reads in a timely manner. Now those meter readers, we're, we're, we're not going to lay them off, we're going to repurpose the meter readers, they're going to be meter service techs, they're going to manage the, the operation of those automated meters and, and repair them when they, when they fail. Uh, so the, we're, we're finishing up the, the Draper-Hefner interconnect. So this year we plan to award the final three segments. The total cost of that uh, for FY23 is $27 million. 
that will enable us to move water from, from either plant throughout the city. And then we have various facility improvements that in FY23 will total $103 million. Some of our water and wastewater facilities are, uh, the components are 40 to 50 years old and have reached the end of their useful life. And then general improvements, um, SCADA, general r and &R, asset management, a uh, total of about 77 million of the capital program this year. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Chris, I think too you might point out, they, so just talk just a second about the, what you presented as the utilities budget, the, the water utility trust budget, and then it's a little bit different than what you see in the budget book, and just explain that difference in how revenues are received in the trust and then transferred over. Okay, so all of our, all of our revenues come into Aquit, and those monies are transferred into the city budget. So the budget says $115 million, but we actually transfer 109. We do about 95% about transfer. And that's because we, we currently have about 120 vacant positions, so we have huge salary savings. So we, we don't need to budget for the whole amount. And that also gives us a little wiggle room in the event that our, our supplies continue to go up. We have some additional funding there that we can use in reserve to handle those uh, increased costs throughout the year. They've been pretty hard to predict, but we've, we, some of our chemicals have gone up 100% in the last year. Chlorine, for instance, went up almost 100% this year. And so we have that little bit of wiggle room in our budget so that we can, we can accommodate those types of things that are unforeseeable uh, when we present our budget. A couple of questions. Um, you mentioned the, the Southeast water supply and the, the second Atoka pipeline. For those that are watching and are not really that familiar with it, can you explain the dimensions of that, the engineering difficulties we've had, and, and how building materials, the availability of building materials has affected that project? Yes, sir. So the project is estimated to be about $900 million. We're building a 72-inch pipeline so that we can bring all of our current, uh, current permitted water from southeast Oklahoma into Oklahoma City, into the Draper Water Treatment Facility. And that water supply should last us through about 2060. We're projecting a growth in the region of about 2 million people. Now, we serve 18 other uh, cities and rural water districts in addition to Oklahoma City. The good thing with that is we have these wholesale customers, so we're serving almost 2 million people who are helping to pay back the cost of that pipeline rather than just the citizens of Oklahoma City. So it's a good thing for, for Oklahoma City and for Central Oklahoma. The project should be completed in about eight years, and that will enable us to, uh, to have plenty of water from southeast Oklahoma to last us throughout uh, 2060. The limiting factor that Oklahoma City had before the first pipeline was built in that is, is the uh, North Canadian River, where right now we have um, a, a fairly large water supply, about 80,000 acre feet per year, but in a dry year, it's only about 25,000 acre feet. So, so it's not very sustainable. So the good thing about bringing the water from southeast Oklahoma, they get about 55 inches of rain a year. And so the, the water supply down there is much more sustainable than it is here in Oklahoma City through the North Canadian. And then also you mentioned the interconnectivity project between uh, Draper and Lake Hefner. And for those people that aren't familiar with that, what, what are the benefits we receive from this interconnectivity? So the way the system is set up, uh, Hefner provides water for about a third of the city from the far northwest towards downtown Oklahoma City, and then the Draper water treatment plant provides water for the other two-thirds. Um, right now, the Hefner plant, uh, with a few modifications, can treat about 100 million gallons a day. That's the maximum yield of the North Canadian River. The long-term uh, plan is to have Draper um, treat about 400 million gallons a day. Right now, it's rated at 150. So as you can see, Three quarters of the water is going to come from Draper. So what we're trying to do is connect the two plants with a large pipeline so that we can move water anywhere in the city from either plant. So if we have a failure of some type, and, and I saw a video of the, of the last EF5 that came through Oklahoma City. 
Somebody at the Draper water plant took the video of that tornado just about at the plant, just before it got there and picked up. But if one of our plants goes out of service with this pipeline in, we can continue to serve the entire city. So it's a very important modification to our, our water supply. Great presentation, thank you very much. Thank you. Chris, uh, I know it's been a few years that we were up for an award for the best tasting water. Have we uh, been involved in any more competitions recently? We actually received an um, award for uh, the fluoridation of our water. Uh, we do have great tasting water, but we also received a, an award from the Association of Metropolitan Water Agencies. That, that's the group that serves 100,000 uh, people or more throughout the United States. So it's the large utilities. We received their platinum award this year for outstanding um, water system management. It, it includes a lot of different pieces, uh, but it's customer service, it's financial management, it's resiliency and reliability. All of those things are covered in their evaluation. It's a very comprehensive evaluation. So, and we received that award this year. But the quality hasn't gone down in terms of the taste? No, sir. Great, thank you. All right, thank you, Chris. Appreciate that. Appreciate thank the presentation you. and all the work of the staff and your team, your whole team. I, I would mention too, I, I, we haven't brought it up, but the, what, the Draper treatment plants had a couple of challenges here recently they've gone through. Chris was on the weekend doing a little bit of work where they had a contractor who'd cut a power line and just that staff out there has done such a great job of keeping things going through some trials, and I appreciate just the constant vigilance and effort of their team. Thank you. So next up we've got Jeff Mulder, the director of our airports department, and Jeff will give his presentation on the airports budget. Jeff's budget is similar to, his presentation will be similar to what Chris's is, where it deals with a trust budget and a city side both. And so he'll show the full trust budget so you get the full picture, but emphasize the portion that's the city budget that aligns with what we, we're adopting um, in our city budget. Jeff? Good morning, everyone. Um, Melissa, there we go. There's a snapshot of our mission for the airports. Obviously, we have three airports in our system, Will Rogers, Wiley Post, and Clarence Page. And uh, the budget obviously covers all of those facilities. Next slide. This is how we organize ourselves in those five particular areas. We primarily use this approach. A lot of it is for cost allocation. So we um, have various areas that we allocate our cost and we generate our revenues, but those are the five areas that uh, we organize ourselves in. Next slide. So the uh, fiscal year, the big number, a little over $114 million on the revenue side, that's about 4.7 million more than this current fiscal year. The primary areas, uh, you, as you can see on that slide, that we um, generate our revenue from parking certainly is one of them, and we're expecting an increase in parking revenue for the next fiscal year, which generates some of that additional 4.7 million. Uh, landing fees uh, as airlines continue to re restore their service, We'll continue to see some increases there. Concessions is our food and beverage in the terminal building. And uh, just as a reminder for, for this budget, all our sources of funds are uh, user generated, so we don't use any uh, local tax dollars to either operate or develop the facilities. Um, and part of this uh, source of revenues, you can see 86 million in revenues, and carryover is the money that we are carrying over from this current particular fiscal year. Next slide. So operating expenses, um, that's about three million more than uh, we currently have in this year's budget. Um, a couple of those reasons are, as some of the other departments talked about, we're seeing increase in operating expenses from materials and supplies. Uh, we also are adding uh, positions, uh, 12 positions to our organization. Back in 2020, the airport was moving ahead with the, uh, adding additional positions, but that was put on hold with uh, obviously COVID, the COVID impact. The, the need for those positions as the airports have grown over the years is there. We've added 
additional um, responsibilities and space. One of the examples is the Lariat Landing, our industrial park at Will Rogers Airport. We now have some maintenance responsibilities there. And just over time, as we've grown uh, and our passengers have grown, we continue to have more needs. And so that's part of our uh, proposal, uh, our, our budget proposal for this next year. Next slide. So capital improvement program, that's a big part of what we do. You, of the 114 million, 63 million of that is in, in construction and capital projects. A Will Rogers Airport um, certainly is a big portion of that. We certainly have a lot of activity also at Wiley Post. A big part of our activity um, is the Mike Maroney Aeronautical Center, the FA Center, and um, uh, over 27 million there, and we have a project at Clarence Page. Next slide. So those are our revenue sources. So 16 million comes from the airport trust and our revenue there. We're anticipating a little over $19 million in FA grants. Uh, tenant maintenance, that is actually the fund that's used to uh, develop projects at uh, Mike Maroney Aeronautical Center, and that gives us our $63 million. Some of the highlights uh, of our capital improvement program, that runway outlined there on the aerial is runway 1331. And uh, we've, we've completed, uh, almost completed phase one, which is the northwest portion of that runway. And the area in color is the phase two that we hope to complete in this next fiscal year. Next slide. A project uh, that we're highlighting at Wiley Post Airport is our, our secondary north-south runway, runway 17 right. The project is to widen that runway, and that will then give the airport and more aircraft the ability to use that runway, which gives the airport more utility and makes it more efficient for operators at the airport. And then a project that uh, is uh, multi-phases, but it involves the terminal roadway at Will Rogers Airport. A couple years ago, the inbound portion was repaved, and now the outbound portion needs to be repaved. So we're going to begin that work. The initial phase, you can see, is 1.8 million, and it'll be in the area there just as you exit the terminal. We'll continue that project over the next couple years uh, with upgrades to that roadway. A couple metrics I want to talk about. Um, of course, you know, overall, uh, this is a good um, indication of where things stand um, from our map and our nonstop locations. Relative, of course, for aviation, everything is relative to 2019 and pre-COVID. Uh, we've recovered pretty nicely. There are a couple markets we do not have back yet. One of them uh, is San Francisco. Another one's Detroit. We, ex we were anticipating those to be back this fall in our recent discussions with the airlines. It looked like that's going to be pushed further, probably to the beginning of 2023. Two factors there. One, Detroit is a, a major business market, and the recovery in air service has primarily been in leisure markets. And San Francisco has a lot of activity to um, Southeast Asia, and Southeast Asia hasn't recovered a lot of those Countries are still in lockdown, and so we haven't seen the air service demand there. So those are some of the factors uh, that we're seeing um, for some of the return of our air service. Next slide. Um, this metric talks about our public parking, which is one of our primary revenue sources. You can see the impact, of course, from COVID, a dramatic drop from, from what we've seen, and it, it, the metric talks about how much capacity we have in the garage on a regular basis. And uh, you can see that uh, as for this fiscal year, um, we expect to uh, exceed 85% of our capacity, 19% of the time. And uh, we can expect that conti to continue to climb in the next fiscal year also. Um, before I move on to this slide, just to, to, uh, we do have a project uh, and a parking study that was done back in, I think it was 2016 or 2017, that made some forecasts for parking capacity and talked about ultimately the need for another parking garage. So we'll, we will uh, be looking at that study again in the near term and uh, we have, do have room to add another garage if the parking recovers as we anticipate, anticipate it will. Um, this uh, metric is for change in boarding passengers. So 
Historically, the airport has grown at 2 or 3% a year. You can see in fiscal 18 and 19 actually were very strong years. And in fiscal 19 actually was a record year for Oklahoma City, about 4.4 million passengers. Obviously, COVID had a dramatic impact and, and passengers, passengers dropped dramatically. And, um, but we are seeing nice recovery. So we're at about 82% um, for fiscal 22 um, compared to where we were in 2019. So nice recovery there. The big numbers, 2019, we're at 4.4 million. 2020, we dropped to 1.2 million. So dramatic drop in passengers. Last year, for 21, we were at about 3.7 million. So those, those are kind of the guardrails there, 3.7, 4.4. We expect this uh, fiscal year we're going to end up uh, around 4 million and then continue to get back to that 4.4 million. Next slide. Um, another revenue source for us, this is the food and beverage and retail concessions that we have in the terminal building. And uh, again, you can see pre-COVID, we had nice growth, um, a dramatic drop. Timed though with that is a new program that began right as COVID was hitting. The airport went out for proposals. This service is provided by a private company. The, the restaurants and gift shops are operated by a private company. We participate as a percentage of the revenue, so we get a percentage of the revenue that they provide. And um, as for those who have been to the terminal building, you've seen some of the new amenities that we've had, um, <clears throat> some of the new restaurants, Starbucks, Vino Volo, Freddy's Steak Burgers, and some of those others, um, Tropical Smoothie have come online. We have probably, it's three or four more venues that are still, uh, will need to be developed here over the next year and a half. So we'll continue to see uh, new venues come online inside the terminal building. And we're expecting a, a good uh, increase in that growth of that activity over uh, the next fiscal year. So this is the, so uh, the 22 million is the, what we consider the city portion of the budget. So the trust actually re uh, pays the city for the cost of services, including the employees and some of the city services that we get. And uh, that's how we break that 22 million into those five categories. I mentioned this earlier. Um, actually, there's 14 positions there. Uh, one's an add delete, um, but it is a combination of positions from various departments, from our operations and in finance, uh, maintenance, engineering, um, and it is from all different sectors, uh, again, based on the growth of our passengers. Uh, the terminal building, we added another 100,000 plus feet to our terminal, so those additional activities and costs now, now need to be addressed. Um, and uh, again, this was, uh, a, the plan was put forward and it was planned to be put forward in 2020 but because of COVID, it was pulled back. But we've reached the point, we've recovered and we see the passenger activity coming back and uh, we've had some long-term needs uh, in multiple departments and we wanted to try to move ahead. So this is our proposal for the next fiscal year. And that concludes my report. One question um, we saw during the Memorial Day weekend a large number of flight cancellations across the United States and we're getting ready to head into our busier period the summer months where a lot of people are traveling. Do you foresee that to be a, a continuing issue in June, July, August, etc.? Yeah, I think so. Um, it's an industry-wide issue and the issues are um, during COVID or, or right after COVID hit, there were a number of furloughs in the airline industry. There were some early retirements and so the workforce uh, shrank some. And the air service has recovered pretty dramatically um, from COVID. And so the airlines are trying to catch up. There's also a long-term issue with pilot workforce avail availability. There aren't enough pilots in the pipeline. And that has to do with a variety of reasons. It's expensive to become, uh, to, to train to be an airline pilot. It takes a long time. There's a number of federal requirements that are in place that are impediments for people becoming pilots. And it's, it's catching up to the system. And so these cancellations that you're seeing really are related to um, a lot of these flights just don't have crew time available. And 
Uh, fortunately, unfortunately for the system, we're seeing some capacity being pulled back. You probably saw some airlines are starting to trim some schedules so they have better reliability. We saw that, so we had meetings with airlines in January and um, were pretty uh, positive uh, conversations with them. They are, they, the airlines that we met with are positive about the Oklahoma City market. They anticipated they'd be back to a full schedule by July of this year. Since that time, with some of these things developing, they've trimmed some of those schedules. So um, on the local level, though, um, I think historically Oklahoma City, one of the capacity constraints has been the checkpoints. They just weren't large enough. We always had large lines going into the ticket lobby. The new checkpoint dramatically improves that situation. So I think the local traveler will have a, a good experience. They won't see the security lines they'd seen in the past. As far as their flights, again, we have, don't have a lot of control over that. So we expect it's going to be a fairly hectic summer uh, with a lot of people flying, and the, the system is constrained right now. Thank and, you. Jeff, could you also just explain, I think you, you alluded to it there, but I've had several people talk to me about, well, it seems like the airport's busier than ever. And it's like there's times where it's just packed because there's so much activity, then other times it's much quieter. Could you just explain kind of what's happening with that, with what you talked about with the scheduling? Sure. Um, so this market is a little unique. We have a lot of departures early in the morning, more than most airports. Typically, you don't see a departure before 6 a.m. Here we have several between 5 and 6 in the morning. Part of that is we have a maintenance base here with SkyWest Airlines, and they feed, they're, they're a regional carrier, and they fly for Delta American United. And they have aircraft here, they fly in overnight for maintenance. They put them then in the schedule to get them into the system, and a lot of times they're trying to hit the, the hubs to hit that first bank that goes to the East Coast. That drives a lot of our scheduling. And so 25% of our departures are before 7 in the morning, to Craig's point, and probably the same amount are after 10 o'clock at night. The arrivals have a lot of late arrivals. So we see huge peaks, which puts constraints on the system, of course, both for checkpoints and baggage and everything else in lines. But um, So we're always looking for more flights. More We have other peaks during the day, a mid-morning and a mid-afternoon peak. but. Those, those are our two times that we're busiest, early morning and late evening. Well, I just want to say welcome. I know this is your first presentation for us, and thank you. Um, one, I just had a couple questions. I know you talked about the three to four new venues to come online within the next year, and seeing the new ones that we have already, how um, many of those are going to be more local businesses? Because I, I guess for some of us with the program you spoke about, with the restaurants specifically, I kind of expected or thought we would see more local restaurants, if that makes sense, right. yep. instead of the, love the Freddy's, no offense, love yeah. Freddy's, love tropical smoothie, um, but I, I'm trying to figure out how can we localize those businesses and make sure that they're present in the airport as well. So um, we have a couple, um, let me see, Osteria, I believe, is one uh, venue that we're going to be seeing. That project begins development later this year, and that, that's going to take over an existing space. Um, I believe another one, and you, you will know this better than I do, I'm new to Oklahoma City, but Hatch, I think, is the, one of the restaurants that we're getting, which I believe is a, a breakfast place here in Oklahoma City. So those are two examples. Uh, Tin Lizzie is, a, I think, a mercantile uh, operator, they'll also, that store is going to be starting development soon. So a couple of those examples. Okay. And to that point, I know there was a conversation about some of those uh, like diverse businesses that we were working to see how they could be a part of the vending uh, process. And, and it sounds to me those names that we mentioned, they aren't. So I'm wondering if we're still working towards that effort of, of making sure we have that kind of representation. Um, and if so, if there's a system uh, we may need to, that I can, we can share uh, for those businesses that may want to be a part of that if, if it's possible. Sure, so the, the concession operator that we have has a program um, for, um, diverse community where they bring in um, disadvantaged business enterprise operators 
And, um, and I, so I don't have a good handle on that yet. Be happy to share that information with you, though. Um, and so that's part of their program is they have local outreach where they bring in local operators from diverse communities, and we have typically percentages and goals that we provide and uh, have give them targets to meet. But um, I'd be happy to provide you some details on that. Okay, I would love that. Thank you. Sure. And then um, to you speaking about those uh, flights that we're awaiting arrival for, speak to the folks who fly, and some of us, I'm probably included in that number, when you're looking for the cheapest flights, um, I, I know, I was surprised to see how many one-way places we have, but in comparison, if I were to fly out of, an, out of a, a, the neighboring state, it's much cheaper for that same one-way flight. So if you just kind of explain the differences of what that is for those, especially new people who are coming and moving into our city and our system, um, they are used to certain things and, and now we have to figure out a way to uplift our system in order for us to be able to have those same features, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, so it's all about seat capacity. So anytime you have a market, the example being the airport's Dallas area, of course, when you have a, a large hub with a lots of available seats, you take the airplane, it's usually divided into different priced seats, first class, business class, and then you have various leisure products. Well, the more seats in the market, the more lower cost seats are available. <clears throat> so as you go to smaller markets, the pie is smaller. That's essentially what you're dealing with. Now, fortunately, what we're seeing in Oklahoma City and some of it's due to the, to the lack of pilots, but airplane, airlines are actually bringing larger aircraft, which helps that scenario. So then you end up with more lower price seats. Um, we, of course, will never uh, be in a situation like a Dallas with that many seats available. But um, we also, though, are actively trying to pursue new carriers that may bring a lower available, you know, there's, there's the normal traditional carriers like American and Southwest, United. Um, w there are some carriers, Frontier and Allegiant, we have them here in our market and we'd like to see them grow. They have a low cost model. Um, so, and I think that segment of the industry will continue to grow. So what we are doing here is we're trying to recruit them to bring more flights. Um, but I think even as a cause of the pilot shortage, we're seeing larger aircraft and more, uh, less expensive seats. Now, every seat relative to two or three months ago is certainly more expensive because of the price of oil. So um, there, there are multiple factors that go into pricing, but it, the size of the market certainly has, uh, uh, impacts the price of the seats. Sure. All right. Thank you all very much. Sure. Thank you, Jeff, and your yep. team. I appreciate all the work that you all do out at the airport for us and that continued effort to try to increase those nonstop flights and get passengers traveling through. So good work. Thank you. Thanks. Yep. So next up, Doug's going to provide a quick summary. We, we just had a very small number of comments that came in. Doug's going to give us, uh, they're going to hand out the comments that we received. Uh, because we only received four. So Doug's going to just give us a quick update on this. We'll give all those to you so you see exactly what was said, but he'll summarize it real quickly for us. Good morning, uh, Council. Thanks. Doug Dowler, Budget Director for the City. This year, the City followed the same method for providing comments as last year. Uh, the comment period was open for 21 days, May 3rd through the 24th. The City provided the same channels for submission of budget comments, email, text message, comments form on OKC.gov and, and of course via mail. This year we only received four comments. Uh, that's down significantly. Last year we received 84 comments uh, and I would note that all of the comments came from OKC.gov. You've got the full text there of the comments but uh, they really just relate to parks and police. Those were really the only two uh, departments that uh, folks commented on um, and so again you have the the full comments there for you to, to to review and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have I just have my only question is why was the why was it limited to the 24th when we had presentations today well simply so that we could have the comments to you a week before adoption 
So the goal was to ha give you time to review those. Uh, we could leave it open longer, but then it's, I guess would be presenting comments kind of in an interim basis as they come in. We could, we could look at doing something like that next year if that's of interest. Yeah, I think in my, in my personal opinion, um, that's why we only had probably those comments because those, those were probably the presentations that people actually were able to see um, and, and be able to comment on. And I, I can imagine with the presentations that were given today that there are some public comments that we want to um, incorporate in, in what we're receiving and viewing. Yeah, certainly if we get more comments, I mean, it's, it is exactly like we followed last year where we had 84 comments, but if we get more comments or something else for to come in, we can certainly share that with the council. Is the, so is the page still open for people to comment or is it closed? It, I mean, we had closed the time period that it's open. I don't know if they could still provide. I'm guessing it's still out there on OKC.gov, but I'd have to go out and check. Yeah, we'll look at that and see, and we can just keep that. We aren't, gonna, we aren't announcing an open time. We are like Doug said, we wanted to make sure we could get it to you all before the adoption so you had plenty of time to have that information, but we can just make sure there's an opportunity there if someone wanted to send an additional comment. Okay, I would, if possible, I'd like for us to we'll at least at that. continue a few more days if possible, just for all of those comments to be gathered. Thank you. And that is all that we have today, Mayor. Thank you. Okay, so we have one resident who has signed up to speak, and that is Michael Washington. Oh, no. 2900 Northeast 18th Street. How's my illustrious, esteemed horseshoe hostess and hostesses this morning? Myself, I'm tremendously happy and pleased that I haven't uh, been here in a minute. But as always, I love bringing my tidbits to your attention. Now, what I want to talk about very briefly is this, this past Saturday, as always, as my group has proven tremendously over and over time and again to do, we were visiting the Oklahoma County Detention Center on the 28th. And guess what? We had a rather, rather large crowd, and we're getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Oh, let me stop before y'all think I'm just bigger and bigger. Now then, we're getting huger and huger and bigger and bigger. You want to know why? Because we're making a difference here in Oklahoma City. And guess what else? We took the outside rally, and some of us went inside, and guess what? The eyes of the people lit up. Oh my God, Michael Watson, you usually don't bring people inside. Let's get out of here. Now they got a bubble that they're in. We walk through the door, and guess what? For 45 minutes, and now y'all know Michael Watson don't lie because my reputation precedes me. 45 minutes, the phone call, phones were unlined. People were calling. We deliberately did it ourselves just to see, okay, y'all, let's call and see are these the actual switchboard operators and things that people called in again. One of the loved ones all right over there, see, need trouble, or maybe one of us might have a heart attack. Let's see. Ring, 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 huh? They have compromised the security of the Oklahoma County Detention Center. And guess what? Your people are in there that y'all can't have contact with. Did y'all not hear me? Did y'all follow me? That's right. Y'all people that y'all let in here contract with the stinking dog to dog over there. That's right. Flagrant disrespect. Don't you ever come talking about Michael Watson has ever been a physical threat to anybody. I, I see that as a flagrant disregard for my humanity and my forcefulness and my nature and my love for people. Don't come at me like that. And then at the same time, use that common sense, deliberate approach to leave. Totally unmanned. Anybody, you want to know why people dying of fentanyl? That's a good reason right there. You want to know why people are bringing drugs and things into the facility? That's the good reason right there, because nobody was there to man the facility as you come coming through the door. All of you have been over there, right? So you know about what part I'm talking about, the receptionist area? Oh, come on, man. Are y'all going to look into that for me? Think I'm lying. I've got it on Channel 4 who did it for me. I called them in. I'm sure y'all saw some of you. Y'all saw somebody coming in. Hey, we're standing here. There's nobody out here with the public is here. No one is out here but us. 30 seconds, please. Okay. That's what I'm saying. And guess what? I want to go back home, going back over there today, and I'm going to make my presence felt. That's right, because Michael Washington don't mean maybe. He means Tavy. That's right. Thank y'all very much, and I will be back. Matter of fact, more frequently, more regularly. Have a good day, baby, because I will be back. I'll start to be stuck to you and all of y'all. Thank you. That concludes the citizens who have signed up to speak. Uh, we have no further business today, and we are adjourned.